Discover the power within. Unity Online Radio. The voice of an awakening world. Welcome to the Yoga Hour, offering insights and practices for spiritually consciously living today. Here's your host, Yogacharya, Ellen Grace O'Brien. Welcome to the Yoga Hour, where we talk about yoga in all its depth and breadth as a path to spiritually conscious, fulfilled living today. I'm Dr. Laurel Trujillo, co-host and producer of the show, and our topic today is faith, one thing that makes all the difference. What is it to have faith? How can it help us in times of challenge, support us in maintaining our equilibrium, and allow us to bounce back from difficulties? Once again, I'm delighted to be here today with the founder, director, and host of the Yoga Yoga Hour, Yogacharya Ellen Grace O'Brien. Yogacharya O'Brien was ordained to teach in the Kriya Yoga tradition in 1982 by her guru, Ryujin Davis, who was a direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. She is an internationally acclaimed spiritual teacher, author, poet, and the founder and spiritual director of the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment, a Kriya Yoga Meditation Center with headquarters in San Jose, California. Yogacharya O'Brien has published several books, including Living the Eternal Way and The Jewel of Abundance, as well as several books of poetry, including The Moon Reminded Me. Her online classes include Arta 365 and Dharma 365. You can find out more about her books and online programs at ellengraceobrien.com and csecenter.org. You can also follow her on social media. She's on Facebook at Ellen Grace O'Brien and on Twitter at Yogacharya underscore live. Welcome, Yogacharya O'Brien. I'm delighted to be here with you on the Yoga Hour. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. It's my pleasure and wonderful that we can have this conversation. Mm -hmm. So before we dive into our dialogue about faith, let's begin with a moment of contemplation. Oh. So let's take a moment to bring ourselves fully present into the now, into this moment now. Start by just noticing your body, bringing your attention to your body and feeling it, feeling the surfaces that it rests on. Perhaps you're sitting or walking, just feeling our body in space. And then bringing our attention to our breath, that one tool that is always with us. So just notice as you take a fully conscious breath, as you inhale and exhale. On the inhale, feel the cool air in the nostrils. And on the exhale, feel the warm air flowing out. And as we turn our attention within, we notice that it can be restful just to be right where we are, not thinking about what's coming next, not worrying about anything in the past, just being here, breathing. And as we rest here, Here's something to contemplate, taken from Yogacharya O'Brien's book, Living for the Sake of the Soul. Even in times of difficulty, the transformative work of the soul goes on. We are always connected to God, whether we feel it to be so or not. The times when we are challenged to find our way are often the opening to a new chapter in our life, inspired and supported by divine grace. (laughs) 
So once again, Yogacharya O'Brien, it's great to be here with you on the Yoga Hour. As is very obvious to all of us, this is a very unique time in our history. We're experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also been unrest in our country related to racial justice and a rocky time in our country's politics. Many of us are looking for relief, for hope, and a spiritual answer. We're looking for something to give us strength to get us through this time. So the title of the program today is One Thing That Makes All the Difference, and I have heard you talk about this in the past as being faith. So let's start there. What is faith? Thank you so much, Dr. Trujillo, and thank you for co-hosting the yoga hour with me and through the years i'm grateful to you and to our listeners um, for keeping the dialogue about yoga at the forefront of our attention and awareness because you know what we study and practice with yoga i think uh is so supportive for us at all times, but especially in troubled times. So there are many tools that we have that can help us clarify our discernment and um, boost our resilience and so on and so forth. So faith, of course, is uh, a really big topic, and I'm glad to be diving into it with you. And I think the question, what is faith? Um, And of course, then we can ask at a personal level, what is my faith? Uh, What do I have faith in? What does faith mean to me? These are all really good questions, really important questions for us to ask. And um, so, you know, as a is an old, (laughs) not chronologically, but an old English major. uh, I I always like to go to the dictionary. What does the dictionary say? And um, so uh, the new American Heritage Dictionary says, faith is a confident belief in the truth, value, or trustworthiness of a person, idea, or thing. It's a belief that does not rest on logical proof or material evidence like faith in miracles. Be loyal. Faith could be loyalty to a person or a thing. Um, it could be belief and trust in God and in the doctrines expressed in the scriptures, um, or religious conviction, a system of religious beliefs. So, um, I think I could agree with all of that. You know, confident belief in the truth um, of of something. You know, for me, it's the truth of uh, spiritual reality, (laughs) capital T, confident belief in that. And I think where faith becomes confusing for people and perhaps gets dismissed is that second part of the definition, um, belief that does not rest on logical proof or material evidence. So in the scientific age, you know, faith um, has been downgraded, you know, as um, you know, magical thinking or just hoping um, because we can't really put our hands on it. But of course, that's the nature of spiritual <laughs> spiritual faith because it's beyond um, the material. I particularly like the definition of faith from the Christian tradition in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the first verse, which is um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Um, now that is a beautiful metaphysical maxim. Um, d- to say it is substance it means right. it is something that has um, well substance, <laughs> something yeah. that 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 is uh, real and that it is evidence. It's something that gives proof to something. So that that is a very beautiful um, metaphysical maxim about what faith is. Substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. So, you know, excuse me while I go into this in a moment more, but uh, I want to draw the arc into yoga and into the teachings that we've had from our lineage of Kriya Yoga um, that helped me understand more about what this is because, um, 
that substance and that evidence has to do with um, the reality of our essence of being mm-hmm. and our ability to know that and to experience it. It, it. it is self-evident, as our teachers would say, it is self-evident. It is revealed by itself. And um, I have turned to the beautiful uh, little book, it's uh, small in size, but not in depth and stature, The Holy Science by Swami Sri Yukteswar, the guru of Paramahansa Yogananda. And here in uh, the sutras five and six, he's defining um, shraddha, our faith in Sanskrit, um, which he says, shraddha is intensification of the heart's natural love. And so, you know, when we unpack that, this we can connect it to that Christian uh, teaching that um, it, it, it is it is intensification of that which is already there. It is coming to the forefront that which is within our own hearts. Um, so let me rest there because I've kind of gone on and <laughs> open to your <laughs> no, uh, reflections no. about that. Oh, no, that, that is, uh, that's great. I do love that, um, Christian, um, verse that you read, you know, the substance of things hoped for is a, it's just a beautiful way of, um, of encapsulating that. So we did title this episode of the yoga hour. <clears throat> one thing that makes all the difference. So how is faith? that one thing that makes all the difference? Well, let me go back to Sri Yukteswar um, because in that same commentary, he says the heart's natural love, um, this faith that he's pointing to, Shraddha, um, intensification of the heart's natural love, the heart's natural love is the principal requisite to attain a holy life. When this love, the heavenly gift of nature, appears in the heart, and then he goes on to describe what happens. You know, it removes the causes of excitation from the system, cools it down (laughs) to a perfectly normal state, Um, and it invigorates the vital powers, um, you know, brings balance and health, basically. Um, And it supports health in body and mind and enables one to... Uh, come to understand the guidance of nature. And then this part, I think, is critical Mm -hmm. to our conversation. He said, when this love becomes developed, it makes us able to understand the real position of our own self, capital S self, as well as that of others surrounding us. So when when faith, this heart's natural love, you know, you could think of faith in this way as springing from that which we know to be true, you know, which is hidden from us when, when we're looking out, you know, into creation, we're looking for evidence, but it's not seen, you know, as as Jesus said, you know, you're going to look here and there, um, but the kingdom of God won't come with observation. It's not going to be a sensory experience um, because it's within you. And so faith, is that experience of the truth that is within us. Mm -hmm. And when we follow that yearning of the heart, you know, to know truth, to know God, to know what we are, um, to know how to live in the highest way, we're basically operating on faith, but it's not faith that is a mental belief. It's faith that has to do with the stirring of the heart because the heart, our essence of being, is connected to that truth. So it is it is evidentiary. It, it, is, uh, it, it is substance-filled because it is based in that which is already true within us. Mm-hmm. I know. I love that. And that is a contrast, as you're saying, to the dictionary definition that you read at the beginning, which is kind of faith is just something that you have that doesn't have any, I I forget the wording that you use, but doesn't have any proof. And this is clear that there is no physical proof. It's not proof that comes from the senses, but yet you can experience this truth. And once you've experienced that truth, um, I go back to the Bhagavad Gita, just a little bit of this practice of yoga and meditation removes great fear. 
And isn't that a gift in this world today with all of this stuff going on and how easy it is for us to be triggered into fear? And yet, if we've had that experience, if we have this spiritual practice, this meditation practice that can gradually take us deeper, and we have these experience, confirmatory experiences for ourselves, then there is that unshakable, you know, center that can make all the difference. And that doesn't mean we don't get drawn off and, you know, still experience these things, but... Um, It certainly has made a difference in my life and my ability to move through these times of great difficulty um, by um, by knowing, um, isn't it, uh, Julian, you know, uh, Sister Julian, all is well, Mm -hmm. you know, that that beautiful, um, Mm -hmm. that beautiful um, saying that she had, you know, I, I uh, again, losing the exact words, but it's all is well, all will be well, you know, and, and just kind of letting go into that and practicing that uh, Niyama, one of the, you know, yoga principles of contentment, you know, which is independent of whatever is happening in the outside world, which in today's world, <laughs> incredibly helpful <laughs> to be able to let go of that and realize in some way all is well. Yeah. And then the question you you know had asked is, you know, um, how is faith one thing that makes all the difference? Right. Um, you know, when we look at what Sri Yukteswar wrote, he, he basically says that faith, when you're when you're living a faith filled life, and this is not a belief-filled life, but a faith-filled life. So we want to make keep making that distinction. Um, but when you lead a faith-filled life, it cools you down. Yes, <laughs> you know you're not hot-headed. Um, you're you're able to to be more even-minded. You know to see into um, the way that things move and change, but to have faith. Um, in the benevolent uh, presence and power in our lives. But, you know, there's an important, in a sense, qualifier, I think, about faith. You know, and even Sri Yukteswar points to it. He says um, that this, you know, brings about health and body and mind and enables one to understand properly the guidance of nature. So, you know, not only is that guidance about you know, what food to eat. But in this climate that we have right now um, about social injustice, um, it, with with faith, you know, we can begin to properly understand our role and what is ours to do to contribute to justice. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not, you know, and, you know, when we look at faith, again, if we turn back to the Christian scriptures, the beautiful verse that says, you know, faith without works is dead, right? <laughs> so in, in, in yoga, it, it's really the same. Um, and the great yoga masters that I have revered and followed from Vivekananda, to Yogananda, um, they they were each, you know, act socially uh, engaged and active in their own way. So yoga is not about, you know, just having faith that it's all going to turn out. Right. Um, it's about having faith that the divine dwells within everyone. And we have to listen to that and understand properly the guidance of nature, which will tell us um, how to live a dharmic life and what is ours to do um, mm-hmm. to contribute to um, healing, um, right. not just for ourselves, but for for all. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I think that's uh, that's so essential. Sometimes when you talk about you know non-attachment or which not means non-attachment to outcomes. Um, there's a fear that it just means kind of not caring about anybody, not doing anything. And I think that's such an important point that you just made to understand, to be cool enough and not sort of triggered into some kind of a reaction, but be able to see clearly what is ours to do and to do it, to do it. And then to um, do it in a, in a, um, um, in a Dharmic way, in a, in a way that's focused on right action um, and yet also understanding that we can't control the outcomes. We can see what's, we can see maybe one step ahead, but mm-hmm. we can't really see, you know, the ultimate, um, um, you know, we can't see the ultimate outcome. That is something that is, is, um, 
we're going to get there. And maybe that's where the faith, the faith comes in. Yeah, I was listening to um, President um, Barack Obama's address to the nation that he gave about a week ago or so, and he and he quoted, um, you know, doc, the quote that Dr. King had polished and you know raised up about the arc, uh, the moral arc of the universe being long, but bending towards justice. Right. And um, mm-hmm. of course, that's a dharmic vision that we have in yoga that, you know, dharma will rise again and again. But what President Obama said that really moved me in that um, talk, he said, you know, this moral arc, you know, bends towards justice. And he said, we bend it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. um That, I thought, was such a powerful thing to raise up. And, of course, that's the truth. It doesn't automatically bend towards justice. We bend it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, there is a lot of... um, there's a lot of suffering that's going on right now, but there's also um, there's also hope. You know, I think it's been, for me, very hopeful to, you know, watch the... the, um, how widespread and how in general peaceful, you know, these very large demonstrations have been and um, how there's a real uh, dawning understanding on the part of uh, most people that there is still injustice and we still definitely need, you know, to take action. And um, it's, it's an away, I feel like it's an awakening, you know, that we're watching, which is, um, yes. which is good. Yes. So, um, <clears throat> We've talked about about faith in general, but what things, knowing that we just have about maybe four minutes before the break, (laughs) what things um, should we have faith in? Where is it important? Well, you know, the teachings of yoga have offered um, one prescription that I think is is helpful. I mean, there are several ways to enter into uh, being a person of faith, um, but the formula that I have seen that I found useful is to, of course, you know, have faith in God, have faith in the teachings and the teacher, and to have faith in oneself. Um, those three. Now, of course, the first one sometimes is the major hurdle for people, especially in this time that we live in, this materialistic age. Well, how do I have faith in God? You know, I don't believe in God. You know, people will say, I don't, I don't believe in the guy in the sky. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's understandable. Um, but, you know, of course, yoga has us look much uh, deeper into um, the cosmology behind faith, which is, you know, looking at how is it that there is this uh, one reality that moves forth into expression. And no matter what name you call it, um, there is that ultimate reality. And it is commonly called God. So sometimes people can find their way into faith by discerning, oh, yeah, it looks like um, there's a power, there's an intelligence behind all of creation. Something's running the universe. Um, so sometimes people can start that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So faith in God, faith in teachings and the teacher and faith in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked a little bit about, um, in, in previous yoga our conversations about resilience and how that's such an important quality uh, today. There's a, you know, a need for us all to be able to, you know, bounce back, especially when things are changing so quickly and these restrictions that we've been under the stay at home um, guidance is, is uh, wearing a bit thin. <laughs> You know, for many people to just be kind of cooped up. And of course, it's, you know, restrictions are lifting at this point, which is helpful, but there's a tendency to maybe just want to break free, you know, of that. Um, so how, um, how does faith help us do that? I mean, how, how does it contribute to our resilience? 
I think we could just going to point back to the earlier part of the conversation and the wisdom of Sri Yukteswar saying, you know, faith will cool down your system <laughs> um, <clears throat> because we can we can get overheated with the tendency, you know, towards restlessness, frustration, anger, um, which we see, you know, that has arisen with, and, you know, and also very real concern, you know, people are uh, concerned about their livelihood, their ability to um, take care of themselves and their families and the economic situation. So it's all mixed up in there, but faith, um, can help us stay calm, which then contributes to our resilience. Mm, absolutely. And with that, we've come to the break. You're listening to The Yoga Hour with host and founder of the show, Yogacharya O'Brien. We're discussing faith, one thing that makes all the difference. Yogacharya offers many online classes and programs and has authored several books, which you can learn more about at her website, ellengraceobrien.com, and also from the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment's website, csecenter.org. We welcome your comments and questions. You can contact us at yogahour at unity.fm. I'm Dr. Laurel Trujillo, producer and co-host of the show. When we come back from the break, we'll explore more about faith. We'll be right back. You're listening to Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. You're listening to the Yoga Hour. Living the Eternal Way with your host, Yogacharya, Ellen Grace O'Brien. Welcome back from the break. I'm Dr. Laurel Trujillo, and here today with Yoga Hour host and founder, Yogacharya, Ellen Grace O'Brien, and we're talking about faith. So, Yogacharya, picking up from where we were before the break, you talked about having faith in spiritual teachings and the spiritual teacher. And I thought this was good. This is a good topic. So what's the importance of having a spiritual teacher? Well, we could do a whole program about that. but <laughs> We have one coming up, actually, with, uh, with Sundari and me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Next good. one. <laughs> good. Um, but I think with regard to faith, um, because we're, we're speaking about something that in terms of a spiritual practice, faith is a spiritual practice. I mean, you can have faith in a, a person or, or faith in a, a, a scientific law, you know, that kind of thing. But if you're talking about spiritual faith, then you're talking about that which is invisible, you know, that is not material. And we need to know how to access it. We need to know how to find it. So a spiritual teacher is, is like a, um, you know, a, a wilderness guide, you know, who gives us a map and right. shows us how to follow that map and has made the journey, you know, himself or herself. And so they are a living a testament of faith. And so we, we get the example of what it looks like to live with faith, but we also get the map on how to find it for ourselves. And mm -hmm. that, of course, is the critical factor. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. It, you know, it, it, in uh, the United States, the history of spiritual teachers has been kind of checkered with a lot of uh, abuses of that relationship and and people kind of automatically go there. And yet, I think here we are, if I wanted to learn to play the guitar, I would go find a guitar teacher. You know, if I, if I, you know, wanted to learn just about anything, I would go look for someone who, you know, knew more about it than I do. And yet, um, that's often something people don't um, think about, you know, when they are on a spiritual path. Yeah, and uh, I think with regard to having faith in the teacher, um, you know, there is um, there is a razor's edge, you know, in the yoga tradition about that 
Um, but having faith in the teacher, in the spiritual teacher, doesn't mean, you know, checking your intellect at the door. It doesn't mean checking your conscience and your reason at the door. That's why I like the formula about faith, that it's faith in God, in higher power, faith in the teacher and the teachings. So it's important that those two are connected, that the teacher is living in such a way and teaching in such a way that is consistent with the truth that has been tested by time. But then the third part of that formula is faith in yourself. So I think some of those abuses of power that have occurred with spiritual teachers over time um, has partially to do, not totally, but partially to do with the naivete of seekers, particularly as they turn to, you know, the romantic ideas of teachers from the East um, and, you know, just a willingness to um, completely surrender their own uh, reason and good sense. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's just not a good idea. Right. Right. Yeah. When you have when I've heard you teach about this in the past, you really made it clear that the power in their relationship really remains with the, with the student, you know, with the disciple and that that's how it's supposed to be. It it should be, it -hmm. should be. And yet, you know, there, like I say, it's like a razor's edge because it is necessary to be able to see God in the guru um, because that is our, In a sense, that's our way of beginning to understand the divine qualities that are that reside in human beings. You know, we we look there first to see it. um, But the function of that is to be a bridge so that we can learn about it in ourselves and learn to see that, you know, everywhere. So, you know, we have we have this initial experience, you know, where. And I've seen this with students over time where, you know, there's so much holiness in the presence of the guru. You know, the student is the best behavior. You know, the food given to the guru is given with love. Um, There's nothing the student wouldn't do, you know, to make the guru comfortable. Um, And then that same person will turn around and, um, you know, treat another student um, very poorly (laughs) or themselves very poorly. Um, And so that that relationship, that training is meant um, to hone our awareness of, you know, guru being omnipresent, you know, so we start in this one place, but ideally, you know, you don't get stuck there. Yeah, for sure. So we, we talked about the teacher, but the teachings. So I know there are a lot of people who kind of uh, dip their toe into a lot of different teaching traditions. So why is it important to, um, you know, have faith in a particular um, set of teachings? Or maybe I should say, is it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, I think that once we find our path, You know, there's some, you know, beautiful teachings about, um, you know, not, you know, being like a a bee, you know, that goes from flower to flower. But at some point, you know, finding the path that is yours so you can settle down and begin to practice in a in a steadfast way and go deep uh, with your own experience of those teachings. You know, with yoga, the goal is to quiet the mind so that the innate um, essence of being can be revealed. And uh, so if we go from teacher to teacher, from practice to practice, from teaching to teaching, they're all they're going to be different, and they're going to have a different emphasis, different practices, and then um, ultimately that leads to confusion. You know, the mm-hmm. mind. You know, you start thinking, well, gee, I learned this mantra from this teacher, and now I have this mantra. Which one should I use? You know, which one is the most effective? Well, likely either one is fine. <laughs> the, right. the problem is, you know, you you've been a you know a spiritual. Um, <laughs> Uh, you've been consuming uh, a spiritual consumer. Uh, the, the term was coined of um, 
I think it was Strongpa that coined the term of spiritual materialism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like gathering all this stuff, which ultimately leads to confusion and doesn't deepen our faith, but leads to doubt and confusion. So having, you know, finding your path and having a sense that, yes, I this is my path and I'm ready to commit myself to it then the ability to go deep with that and having faith in the teachings um, means that you're likely to do what you need to do to discover the deep truth of them. If you don't have faith in them, why would you even practice? You know, why mm -hmm. would you even um, explore them? So faith is a necessary ingredient. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to do it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So we've talked about faith in ourselves, in the spiritual teacher, and the teachings. And when we look at that, look at those questions, you know, kind of what's behind that, aren't we really talking about faith in God, however we perceive God to be, which I guess we touched on earlier, but if you wanted to, you know, expand on that a little bit, I mean, you know, that is... Um, we, you know, we trip over that word, as you said, but let's say faith in ultimate rea reality. Um, isn't that really what we're talking about? It is, and those three are simply avenues for experiencing that one thing. And um, I know that in my own awakening process, as I met my teacher, Roy Eugene Davis, and I began to study and practice, um, it was, it was, I mean, it still is, but especially in that beginning time, it was like coming alive. Mm -hmm. I began to experience God everywhere. I mean, I think at that time I could have just opened the phone book. That was when we used to have phone books. <laughs> right. and, and feel like, you know, God was giving me a message um, because it, I, my heart had just broken open and my mind um, was receptive to the teachings of God being everywhere. And I began to see and experience God everywhere. I was just on fire with that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that connection to ultimate reality or God is what can help bring us equanimity in terms of times of turmoil. And you've quoted Paramahansa Yogananda. I've heard you say this, if, you know, several times point to this quote, who said, you would not yearn to know God, if it was not possible for you, which I think is very hopeful. It's always been a very hopeful quote to me, you would not yearn to know God, if it was not possible for you. So would you tell us more about that? Yeah, I love that quote, too. And when I teach from it, you know, I often <laughs> I, I often use food as my metaphor. Um, I like food a lot. And so <laughs> it's a <laughs> close metaphor for me. And I say, you know, if you are, you, you know, you yearn for a, like a sweet treat, you know, a chocolate or an ice cream or you know, something like that. It's something that you have a taste of. You know, we don't yearn for a flavor that we've never tasted. I mean, we might yearn for something unusual and haven't, you know, want that. But when we want something, we have a yearning um, to experience something, you know, it is because we've already tasted it that brings us that hunger. And I want to just arc back to the beginning of the show when I was talking about um, the teachings from uh, Swami Sri Yukteswar saying that faith or shraddha is intensification of the heart's natural love. Mm -hmm. So there is a correlation between those quotes now, this one from Paramahansa Yogananda that you offered, that we wouldn't yearn to know God if it wasn't possible for us. It's possible for us because it resides in us. And that's a core teaching of yoga that, you know, we can know God because God is our life. You know, if we posit this idea that God is some separate something out there, we can never know God in that <clears throat> 
in that conception of the universe because you can never know that which is separate from you. You can only know about it. Mm. Um, but you can know that which y- you can experience directly. Mm-hmm. Um, you can know it for yourself. You can know the truth of it. And, of course, with yoga, you become that or it, it is revealed to you that you are that. God mm-hmm. is your life. God is your self. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's just really beautiful. I love the correlation between the the Yukteswar quote from earlier, the faith as the... Um, you know, sweetness of the heart. And this one from Yogananda, you would not yearn to know God if it was not possible for you. And again, I just feel like that is just so hopeful Mm -hmm. that, you know, with the food analogy is great because everyone's experienced that, you know, um, I've been, you know, wanting a chocolate milkshake because I've (laughs) had one before. (laughs) But when we talk about faith, <clears throat> and perhaps especially at this time when there's so much going on, um, we have doubts. And if we have doubts, does that mean that we don't have faith? Mm. Um, I think when we have doubts, it means that our faith is troubled. And that's always a good thing. Um, this morning I was thinking about the hymn, <laughs> One of the f- favorite ones is a wade in the water, you mm-hmm. know, wade in the water, children. God's going to trouble the waters. And that's such an interesting line in that song. And, you know, my experience has been that God has troubled the waters in my mind, you know, many times. And it's about opening me to a new awareness. And there have been many times in my spiritual journey where God has removed my understanding of God itself. You know, I would just come to like, okay, I got this. (laughs) And then, you know, just like the carpet being pulled out, you know, from, from under me, because um, we're always moving into a more expanded consciousness, a higher awareness. And so I think doubt um, can be held in the context of faith as a way in which we are being called up, you know, to let go of a limited understanding and, um, you know, move forth into a higher realization. Mm. That's a really beautiful way of thinking about that, something I think we've all experienced and how wonderful to be able to hold it in a larger way, you know, that it's not a um, lack of faith, but that it's an opportunity or an arrow pointing to um, your uh, opportunity or your ability to expand your faith Mm -hmm. to that there's more, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, your faith is dead. Um, You know, it becomes a concept. And um, so I like to think about faith as living, living faith. So as we live it, uh, we grow, we learn, uh, our awareness expands. And that's a useful thing. But, you know, of course, that has to be, you know, modulated, um, and I think that's we can we can hearken back to the earlier part of our conversation about why a spiritual teacher and a practice and a practice community is important, because sometimes you know we become over you know overcome overwhelmed with our doubts, and uh, you know that happens to many people in which they simply just cast their faith aside. Mm. So at times like that, the the teacher can be a beacon of light, uh, the community can be a beacon of light to help us find uh, a deeper faith. Mm. So we've talked about faith and its importance. What do you see, and perhaps we've even talked about it, doubt, what do you see as the greatest obstacle to faith? I think the greatest obstacle to spiritual faith is our tendency to have faith in externals Mm -hmm. and for that to override 
our um, faith in the invisible um, forms of support. So we get, you know, pulled into counting on um, externals as the source of our happiness or our security or our faith in the goodness of life. And so when those things are taken or troubled, um, then we, we lose our faith. But um, so I think it's that, you know, tendency to be externalized too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, the primary error, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, of, of yeah. uh, mm-hmm. forgetting who we are. Mm-hmm. So how about the greatest support for faith? The greatest support for faith, I think, is um, to be steadfast on your spiritual path um, and and to be committed to that. Um, You know, one of the things that I had difficulty with um, on my path early on was I didn't feel that there was space for the times of desolation. Mm. And that scared me. I mean, you know, I talked about how high I was when I found the teacher in the path and, you know, God was everywhere. And then I went through a period of time where God was nowhere. And, Mm. you know, I was, um, you know, all I could see was my own failings. You know, I had tried so hard to follow the teachings and, you know, I was uh, behaving and I couldn't, you know, stop my habits that were not useful. And I just thought, this is not working. You know, this is really, um, this is a sham. This is terrible. And I was, I was really on the verge of losing my faith. But, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, God pulled me through it. Um, so I think that um, we have to understand that there are these cycles to the spiritual life and have a context that holds them. Because when we come onto the path and we have this you know, blazing faith, one of the things that happens is we begin to see um, the things that need to change. Right. I was just going to say that what you just described of having this, this, you know, <laughs> a time of difficulty after you commit to the path is, a, is really common. Mm-hmm. Um, that it, um, all of a sudden, I mean, we may have entered on the path because we're suffering mm-hmm. and see all of the, you know, difficulties. And then the difficulties seem even worse <laughs> because we <laughs> We want to be so different. We can see the ways in which we're we're falling short in ways we didn't even we couldn't even understand before. And now we can understand it. <laughs> it makes it even worse, as you said. Mm-hmm. So so I just wanted to say that that certainly was my experience, and I know I've talked to other people, the experience of many others that that is something that um, I love how you described having. The, this vision of the spiritual path as being able to hold both of those, you know, extremes that there are ups and downs certainly on the spiritual path and that it doesn't mean that you're on the wrong path to have those feelings. Yeah. And actually it can mean that you're on the right path um, because it's working. Um, But I didn't, at the time I didn't have a model. I couldn't see in the teachings. I felt that the teachings were, you know, that we were supposed to go from glory to glory and strength to strength and, you know, high to high or high to higher. And I was going, you know, high to low. And I just didn't, I didn't have uh, an insight about that. But now, you know, I can certainly see that it's part of our spiritual formation, you know, to go through those times. And, you know, I, I, at that time, I gained some insight from the Christian mystics, you know, who, um, they were good at describing the low lows. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah. And with that, unbelievably, we're coming to the end. But in closing, uh, we have about a minute and a half or so. Uh, what words of encouragement or inspiration would you like to leave with our listeners? I think uh, now, as we have been talking about this 
cycles in the spiritual life, you know, that it isn't, it doesn't always feel easy. It doesn't always feel light. Um, and there are times of darkness. And I think that if we can hold that in the times of darkness, there is a new birth that's occurring. There's a new consciousness that is in formation. And so we can see that in our personal lives, in our national life, and in our global life. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. You've been listening to The Yoga Hour. It's been my pleasure to share this time with you. I'm Dr. Laurel Trujillo, co-host of the show. We've been discussing faith, the one thing that makes all the difference with The Yoga Hour's founder and host, Yogacharya Ellen Grace O'Brien. Yogacharya O'Brien is an internationally acclaimed spiritual teacher, author, poet, and founder and spiritual director of the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment. And you can read more about online classes and um, et cetera at her website, ellengraceobrien.com. You can also hear many of her online talks on her YouTube channel, Ellen Grace O'Brien. And the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment is offering many online programs, including Sunday morning programs and other uh, daily meditation programs with Yogacharya O'Brien and other ministry leaders. You can find out more about that at csecenter.org. Thank you so much, Yogacharya. I've really, really enjoyed speaking with you today. It's been a pleasure, uh, as always, to be here with you.